Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Mike Bentz, the executive director of Foundation for Freedom Online, was featured a couple of uh, weeks ago on Tucker Carlson's show, uh, talking about um, how uh, the internet was transformed from the greatest commons, the greatest free speech forum in human history into the largest censorship op- enterprise in human history. And I found the entire discussion intriguing uh, from an Israeli perspective, but uh, immediately after I watched the show, uh, I contacted Mike Benz, who um, during the Trump years, he was the assistant, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Communications and Information Technology, which is really just like all the internet diplomacy of the United States government. Um, and I contacted him immediately and asked him whether he would uh, be on the show and talk about it a little bit from the Israeli perspective. Uh, and he was nice enough uh, to say yes, and we were able to schedule it for today. So first of all, I want to thank you for coming and welcome you, uh, Mike Benz, to the Carol Election. Thank you, Carolyn. Great to, great to speak with you. Well, I, I was wondering, you know, I, I'm not sure, I mean, many people watch the uh, interview that you did with Tucker Carlson, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that all of my uh, audience did. So can you just sort of walk us through for a second about uh, what happened in 2014 and, and really how did it come about uh, what you saw as uh, U.S. Uh, uh, government agencies really taking a knife to the concept of online free speech and, and, and beginning to exercise full-scale uh, censorship through the social media platforms that we all use today. Yeah, the, the internet had been a, a weapon of an instrument of statecraft is probably the best way to put it, uh, since it had first been rolled out privately with the World Wide Web in 1991. You know, right from the outset, the, the U.S. government was funding free speech technology and was promoting free speech on the internet, not not so much on First Amendment grounds, but on soft power projection grounds. You know, the same way that after World War II ended and traditional empire building was collapsed under international law, you could no longer conquer territory by military occupation. You had to move into a sort of modality of, of political control. And so we created a CIA in 1948. We renamed our War Department to the Department of Defense all or oriented uh, around this new emphasis on soft power uh, that is informational and economic and media control rather than hard power, meaning military control. And so, you know, in the 20th century, we had many modalities of, of, of statecraft that were pumped in around the world. You know, the CIA had things like Voice of America and Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and Radio Free Asia and 800 different media proprietaries under the State Department and, uh, and the Central Intelligence Agency. And then there was a catch up in those modalities throughout the 20th century as other countries began to develop their own internal programming and, uh, and locked over control of, of state media. The internet, when it was made private in 1991. So it's a- important, can I just, can I stop you just one thing? It's important because I think one of the aspects that people forget about with the Cold War is that it was very much also a war of ideas that the KGB through the common turn and through other agents of influence throughout the Western world was working to uh, decrease uh, trust and support for Western values, Western institutions in Western societies. And then the sort of the mirror operation were things like Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, et cetera, that were broadcasting behind the Iron Curtain to try to, you know, bring a different message to the people there, right? Totally. And let me also say, I am not casting moral aspersions on, on that work. You know, you can you can make a, a very reasonable argument. Uh, you know, there are many competing schools of foreign policy thought that, that say that that was, that was doing you know, very positive work uh, to counter, counter communism. I think you, people on the other side might feel you know that that was you know an overstep or manipulation. There's there's reasonable argument I think on both sides there. The issue is is uh, with the major events of geopolitical turbulence between 2014 and 2016, those tactics that were used first to take on fascism in the run up to World War II and then to take on communism throughout the entire Cold War of the 20th century began to be turned on populism, domestic populism, that exact same right. so before, toolkit. So I, I interrupted you. So before you go to 2014, 2016, go back for a second to 91 until 20, 
14, where we saw the development of the internet in a different way. Right. So from 1991 to 2004, you had Web 1.0, which were things like forums and blogs and static websites. This is before the centralization of social media. And right away, you had the Defense Department, the NSA, the CIA, and the State Department highly active on this newly outbound global uh, internet. So, you know, for example, in the Tucker interview, I discussed the origins of Google. You know, Google started as a company in 1996, but it was start, it started as a project of Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the two founders, as Stanford PhDs, where their PhD grant came from DARPA, the you know the the, the you know the Pentagon's brain as it's known, and it was a DARPA grant that was a joint CIA NSA grant for how to how to track birds of a feather flocking together on the internet uh, with respect to how they traffic from search engines to uh, to static web pages. And so the, the original Google backbone architecture was essentially laid by the CIA and the NSA as they were tracking the rise and fall of, of political groups internationally. They wanted to create a kind of uh, insurgency, counterinsurgency heat map based on how dissident groups discussed their their politics on on forums and web pages, and in addition to that, uh, the State Department was was the biggest fan of free speech because it was using U.S. aid money and National Endowment for Democracy money to to fund and to even train its own state backed dissident groups in foreign countries so that they could overcome state run media. If say you were in in a, in a country like China or Egypt where there was you know, heavy state control over over uh, you know, analog media using these new forums that were untouchable because it was a World Wide Web by the government was a way to coalesce a critical mass of, of movements to overthrow a government that was perceived to be hostile by the US. And you know, the, the sort of, in 2004, 2005, 2006, you had Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and then in 2007, you had the smartphone. And so that kicked off this social media age. And right away, you had the State Department create this new digital diplomacy doctrine around how to use social media and the centralization of that uh, in the context of regime change and, and color revolutions. You know, in the Tucker interview, I went through, you know, the, the who's who character, you know, arc of all that. It ended up coming right back to Google where, uh, you know, where, where Google would create these, you know, basically it was a State Department project that then. Google turned into these AI censorship weapons, but it all culminated in, some, in the Arab Spring in uh, 2011, 2012. This was sort of the high watermark of, uh, of free speech diplomacy in the eyes of the State Department, where one after another, all of these Middle East, North African country, countries had their governments toppled in Facebook revolutions and Twitter revolutions. And so you know, that, that was perceived to be sort of the, the halcyon era of free speech on the internet. It could do no wrong, and then uh, within a few short years, uh, uh, there was there was turbulence uh, on, on the free speech front as uh, events like the Crimea annexation happened uh, and the Ukrainian counter coup to the U.S. led toppling of the Viktor Yanukovych government in Ukraine. And it was at that point, combined with a few other a few other events that the State Department began to say, hey, you know what, this free speech thing might not be an unalloyed good. We may actually. Can I ask need- you a question about that? Yeah. You 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 date it to the to the Ukrainian, uh, the you know unrest, the revolutions, the counter revolutions, etc. But you said the high water mark of this free speech in on the internet was the Arab Spring, and here I'm wondering, you know, Israelis and Saudis and other U.S. allies in the Middle East were aghast at what happened in the in the Arab Spring because what happened in the Arab Spring is that. You had the Muslim Brotherhood taking over Egypt and Tunis and other and other states, key states from from everybody's perspective. Egypt is the most powerful, most populated, you know, ha- highest population Arab country is ninety million people, um, and you're bringing in the Muslim Brotherhood, which is aligned with Al Qaeda, and um, that was the product of the Google Revolution in in Egypt. Did but the Obama administration was supported. The Muslim Brotherhood government. So, did that not lead to a reassessment? Gee, maybe this is helping the most extreme 
elements inside of the Arab world, and this might not be a good idea, that that wasn't part of the reconsideration of what was happening on the web? That well, they, they didn't th they didn't see that as a problem? Because you say you say Ukraine was the problem. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, from from an, from looking at it from Jerusalem, uh, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, the ouster of America's most stable ally in the Arab world, Bosnia and Mubarak, that, that was the problem. Well, this gets to the, the intricate tango dance of, of how the U.S. foreign policy establishment works with extremist groups around the world. I mean, you know, before the, you know, the, in the 1970s, the you know the, you can make an argument that you know uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS you know their origins were in the, the Mujahideen that were fun that were you know you had you had uh, it's a big new Brzezinski making you know personal trips you know dangling himself out of a helicopter essentially to to tell them that they're that they were on a mission from God and you're going to have limitless support from the U.S. Congress and you know these are as as fundamentalist you know groups as you can get I mean even what in the story in Ukraine is is a great analogy as well. You know the um, the Azov Battalion was declared to be a neo-Nazi Nazi. group. They were they were banned under the dangerous organizations um, uh, policy of Facebook, Google, and uh, several other platforms online. They were censured formally as as uh, as Nazi groups by Congress in 2012 or 2013. Uh, and then suddenly, when they you know because they were fundamentalists, because they were militaristic, because they were willing to carry out war against enemies of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, they became media darlings all over again. Their whole image was whitewashed. They were unbanned from Facebook. They they would have they were they had personal meetings with Chuck Schumer. They uh you know it was it was you know inflatable extremism when it can be used as a battering ram to achieve an objective. And so I see the Muslim Brotherhood uh you know, sort of fundamentalism in, in that in that. As part of that same lineage that uh, that that has been a has a long pedigree in U.S. statecraft. Uh, the the issue is is once you collapse this distinction between civilian and military control over media, um, you really lose uh, everything that you think you, you know underpins the the concept of of democracy. The, the fact is is democracy is get derives its legitimacy as as government by consent of the governed. Well, if, if people can't even, you know, decide with their own hearts and minds because civilian media is controlled by the military class, I mean, this is the sort of thing that you would, you would expect in, in North Korea or some sort of military junta state. This, this doctrine of hybrid warfare, this idea that you need to have the foreign policy establishment control domestic speech so that U.S. voters can't influence foreign policy. They can't change it. You know, it reminds me of the sort of Pakistani hybrid governance model where the people can vote, you know, on a prime minister who's allowed to determine, you know, what the tax law is or if there's a stop sign on one street or another, but can't decide anything related to military intelligence or foreign policy. That's for a separate permanent intelligence class. And, and that's really what's been constructed within the United States um, since, you know, it, since at least 2016. So okay, so let's just talk for a second about what you're what you were saying about Ukraine, and then more broadly the populist movements uh, in Europe and in the West, and and then and then rather than move to uh, Trump and the United States and censorship of Americans, I I kind of want to move back to the Middle East so that we can touch on that a little bit because I, it is related. So can you just walk us through? Yeah, so. You know, I think for, for purposes of this conversation, one of the most kind of interesting aspects of my discovery of, you know, a, a sort of tracking the censorship industry for eight years was, you know, I initially thought of internet censorship in, in 2016 when I first came across this as, as being a sort of dom purely domestic, you know, process where, you know, it was a, a partisan political thing and it was bipartisan political actors and and then, you know, tracing it up and up the chain, you know, I, I you would you would see that they these institutions are the, the thought leadership that, uh, that you see articulated at, at Facebook or YouTube was being sort of downstreamed from these larger consensus building institutions, places like the Atlantic Council, which was which built itself, you know, as NATO's think tank. It's uh, it's basically a barometer for the U.S. Intelligence Committee. They currently have seven former CIA directors on their board of directors. You know, a lot of people don't even know that 
seven former heads of the CIA are still alive, let alone all concentrate on the board of one tiny little uh, you know think tank that's the main sort of thought leader in the censorship industry space. But it gets annual funding from the Pentagon, the State Department, and CIA cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy. So this is a you know this is a intelligence community consensus, government funded. Uh, consensus organ consensus building organization where you know in 2016 and, and and on actually right after the Crimea annexation 2014 they became they were they were one of the progenitors of this hybrid warfare from tanks to tweets concepts and I would be listening into the their their live streams and reading their white papers and there was this strange confluence uh, between meetings around control over over domestic populist politics in the U.S. and in Europe uh, and M Middle East energy policy. You know, they would have these uh, these conferences on Russian disinformation and U.S. and European proxies for uh, for Russian disinformation groups like, you know, like the Trump, you know, sort of movement in the U.S., the Brexit movement in U.K., you know, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, you know, uh, political populist groups in Italy and Spain and Germany all over. You know, many, many of which, you know, populist groups, including Bolsonaro in Brazil, that had a, a close affiliation with um, with Netanyahu, with, with, you know, with the Netanyahu government in, in Israel, at least on diplomatic grounds. There was this sort of nationalist populist alliance that was that was strongly burgeoning between 2016 and 2019 that was uh, that was forming really the first ever. It, you know, they were referring to it, the foreign policy establishment was referring to it as a sort of not a. Uh, a new non-aligned movement, you know, this the, a group of sort of political neutrals during the Cold War who were proving themselves to be a nuisance um, to uh, to state, you know, U.S. statecraft because they were not going along with the program. This was essentially how they were describing this nationalist populist axis that stretched from the U.S., you know, into you know Brazil and into Europe and into Israel. But what I thought what I thought was so strange about it is they would have you know, these eight hour conferences and the first two hours would be, you know, Russian disinformation and how, you know, and, and how we need to stop it. And here's who we need to censor and how we need to do it and how we need to create this whole society mobilization so that there's a government, private sector and civil society and media, you know, uh, uh, full, uh, you know full spectrum alliance on this. Then that meeting would conclude and the next, th there would be the same conference and the very next set of panelists would be, you know, <laughs> would be about the, I, you know, the, the, the implications of Trump's policy on the Iran uh, on rolling back the Iran nuclear deal and how we could get a backdoor, uh, how we could how we, how we could basically get around, you know, uh, create a sort of Iran nuclear deal 2.0 in order to be able to, you know, have NATO energy companies form partnerships to you know with the export of you know the world's number th three and four respectively, you know, e exports of oil and gas. It was this was something they had been working on. In the pre-Trump era, very intensely, you know, they had this maximum. The, the the Biden world foreign policy establishment had this this policy of maximum pressure on Russia, neutrality with Iran. Trump reversed that neutrality with Russia, you know, by and large, uh, and maximum pressure on Iran, which had a really nasty collateral impact on all of these investments that were being propped up in anticipation of the successful rollout. Of of the JCPOA as it was as its you know implementation was you know would be on a decade two decade uh, you know rollout so you had all of these in investors you know the 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 Atlantic Council is a group that again is not just seven CIA directors on its board it's funded by energy and military contractors you know it's all the you know the the major uh, oil and gas companies provide annual funding to this same group. They were having these stakeholder meetings about uh, how to stop the Trump policy on uh, on maximum pressure on Iran. Uh, you know, th there would be these recurring uh, references to the sort of hostile uh, point of view of the Likud party and, and other Netanyahu allies and being hostile to uh, opening up Iran. So I was sitting thinking, what is going on? What is going on here? I thought this was just a story about domestic sense, domestic censorship of, of Americans. And what you're really seeing is this much larger plot involving everything from the Pentagon to the State Department to the CIA to the external 
you know, group of chamber of commerce companies to their financial investors in Wall Street and London, who are who are all terrified by the role of social media in being able to domestically elect nationalist populist politicians who might disrupt the profitable investments or or long term plans of you know, essentially a syndicate of foreign policy stakeholders. And I think that the Netanyahu government ran headlong into that. And what we're seeing now with Chuck Schumer, the head of the U.S. Senate, calling for regime change and new elections in Israel. And then the very next day, the sitting president, Joe Biden, saying, I I agree with Chuck Schumer's speech. He said nothing wrong. You know, when the head of the Senate, by the way, who's ex officio on the U.S. on, on the Intelligence Committee, you know, there was Chuck Schumer who said the intelligence com- the community has six ways from Sunday to get back at you if you cross them. So it's Chuck Schumer. And the, if the head of the U.S. Senate, you know, one of the one of the only nine people in the Democrat Party who's allowed to oversee the CIA, the president of the United States are both echoing regime change in, in Israel. What do you think the Central Intelligence Director is doing? What do you think the State Department's working on in the background? And like I said, you know, you, you knew all this stuff six years ago if you were just paying attention to Atlanta Council YouTube videos. So let me just go back for a second, because you were saying that essentially it, 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 you said it here, but you said it very crisply with with Tucker. And I just want to sort of uh, make sure that I got it right. You basically said that uh, beginning around 2014 and then increasingly with Brexit and um and the rise of the uh, AFD and the in Germany and like you said, Viktor Orban and other nationalist parties throughout Europe, that they started seeing these nationalist parties that are rising and they were rising because people were talking to one another online, parties that were opposed to this kind of uh, Atlantic Council view of things from uh, get to get elected. And this freaked them out. And that's why they started then coming down very hard on specific uh, groups and actors inside of domestic discourses across a range of Western countries. And it was that statement that really struck a chord with me uh, in Israel because I had that happen to me around the time that you're talking about. In 2015, we had elections here. And um, At that time, I was huge on Facebook. I don't know how it happened, but, you know, it did. And every post, whether it was in Hebrew or in English, that I wrote on that platform was receiving, on average, over 100,000 views. And then all of a sudden, overnight, those numbers went down from 100,000 to 1,000. And then when I started building it back up and I was getting to 50,000 after like six months, it went down again to 1,000. So I realized there was like, it happened twice. It wasn't a fluke. It was it was a plan, um, and it wasn't just me. And I sort of was lucky because I wasn't banned. But all of these other Israeli conservative voices that had been prominent voices online, whether in Hebrew or in English, were getting shadow banned or deplatformed. Uh, people who were making their money on ads from Facebook and other things with their information platforms here were getting were getting uh, what's it called when they get de. Yeah, the platform yeah. from the advertising so they yeah, can't yeah, make any money on yeah. mm-hmm. demonetized right that was where i was important they were got demonetized and so all at all of all of these people on the israeli right were getting censored in a big way by facebook in particular but i would assume by other platforms that was just the one that i that i used at the time and um, at the same time in 2015 in the elections we found out that the state department was funding an organization called V15 that was running an anti-Netanyahu campaign, which is a, it was direct interference in Israel's election. They were also bringing Arab uh, political parties to the United States for political training for how to organize uh, people to come out to get the vote, uh, to get people to vote uh, in the in the ballot boxes before the 2015 election. So we saw a very clear aggressive censorship of Israelis on the right before the 2015 election and then since then. And so that really struck a chord with me and it went along with this 2013 exposure of um, a black ops budget for the State Department that was, I think, exposed with uh, uh, Snowden's uh, theft of all the U.S. classified documents that said that uh, Israel, um, it says uh, that um, Israel 
Uh, they, in, I'm just quoting from an article at the time that I pulled up, uh, that to further safeguard our classified networks, the United States, we continue to strengthen insider threat detection capabilities across the community. In addition, we are investing in target surveillance and offensive counterintelligence against key targets such as China, Russia, Iran, Israel, Pakistan, and Cuba. So during the Obama administration, again, they make Israel a uh, top intelligence target for the U.S. intelligence community. And then in 2014, 2015, they started massively censoring Israelis on the political right on Facebook. I don't know, they, you know, I can't say that it was the U.S. government that did it, but it was these platforms, these major platforms, in particular Facebook, that was coming down very hard against uh, Israeli conservatives. So that that really struck a chord with me. Do you have any sense of of those operations, of the of the operations specifically against people on the Israeli political right? That timing lines up perfectly because it was 2015 when the JCPOA was ratified. Right. Yeah, that in was 2014 in... when it was being negotiated. And exactly. Secret. Right. Yeah. And they've been being worked on for, for years. And yeah, you know, they, they immediately identified the Netanyahu government as being the biggest blocker to that, you know, because of the security concerns that Israel had about what would happen if, you know, I mean, already you have, you know, the, the militarism from Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, you know, with, with Iran under sanctions, if you were to relieve those sanctions and then, you know, 30x the economy of of Iran to be able to fund those those uh, those proxy groups. I mean that would be an overwhelming um, you know military catastrophe potentially for the state of Israel. And so Netanyahu obviously understood you know that um, that existential threat and tried to exert diplomatic counter pressure, which was a big big blocker for the ability to get this done and the ability to protect it politically. You know post post ratification. And so yeah, I I find that timing to be very strange that the very year that that, uh, you know, as that was happening was exactly when uh, when, you know, people perceived to be media allies of the uh, of the Netanyahu government were being targeted for takedown. And again, this is right around the time, uh, you know, 2014, 2015 was right around the time when you had the uh, the foreign, U.S. foreign policy establishment uh, look at the inverse of propaganda in, in the end, you know, focus on, on censorship. You know, there's, we've always, U.S. statecraft has always involved knob upturning of our own, you know, foreign policy goals and values. And, you know, you can call this not even pejoratively, you know, turning up our own propaganda, but the ability to do censorship in the analog era was very limited. You had to have a, the CIA would have to bribe a newspaper or, extort a media personality or something that was uh, that you can't really scale that but with social media you know it's it's if you simply have a liaison uh, at at Facebook to be able to do your bidding uh, it's it's one phone call or one email and what you find is the heads of the trust and safety teams at uh, at Facebook and, and YouTube are 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 former CIA folks in fact most of the top ranks are former CIA folks you know at, at Facebook. Has this been going on for a while? I remember that um, they were, you know, when all of this is coming out, when Elon Musk bought Twitter, um, I was wondering whether that was a recent phenomenon or whether that's been happening all along. Do you know? Well, I don't know if it was happening in the in the first five or six years of social media. It, you know, it was. You did have these incidents of the the state cra uh, of the the State Department, you know, making requests of social media companies. Um, it, you know, in uh, from 2004 through 2009, you know, and then you certainly the events of 2014, the, this hybrid warfare doctrine, part of that involved capacity building within the tech companies in order to create an, a, a conjoined infrastructure between the national security state foreign policy establishment and the tech companies themselves. So, for example, it was in 2014 when the first formal you know, censorship office within the U.S. government was, was really created. This was something called the State Department's Global Engagement Center. This was created in 2014 by a guy named Rick Stengel. Rick Stengel was the former managing editor of Time magazine, and then he, he, uh, you know, he declared himself to be Obama's propagandist-in-chief. He was the undersecretary for public affairs 
at, at the State Department, which is the which is the role that coordinates the State Department and the media. So it's you know how you get this essentially you know surround sound of media echoing State Department uh, talking points is is through the office that he ran. But he created a new office called the Global Engagement Center, which was set up so that the State Department on foreign facing affairs, so not affecting U.S. citizens or U.S. policy on U.S. soil, but could co- co- coordinate directly with the tech platforms for censoring things on the internet that were deemed to be hostile to U.S. national interests or were deemed to be a sort of terrorist threat or whatnot. So that was in 2014 when the first censorship office was set up within the State Department. And then, you know, 2018, DHS would create a domestic one. That's what's currently being litigated in our, the U.S. Supreme Court today. And the oral argument is this this sort of domestic branch of that. But it was in 2014 when, you know, the, the concept of fast precise and comprehensive internet censorship uh, became a focus of study after which essentially billions of dollars poured into the space and it became an industry, you know, that I, that I term the censorship industry. You know, it's really weird because it's actually a, a internal and internal and external thing when you think about it, because it was in 2014 that you had the IRS investigations of all the Tea Party uh, groups and it wasn't just a Tea Party groups. You also had audits um, and and prohibitions on on five hundred one c three accreditation to um, Z Street, which was a right wing pro Israel educational organization that was not and and they were told by the IRS that they were not given uh, their five hundred one c three status because they were aligned with the Israeli right and. That was also ahead of the 2014 elections. And then you also had uh, the Wall Street Journal exposed, I think in 2014, it might have been in 2015, that the, you know, the sort of the, that the NSA was being used um, against APAC officials who were coordinating their campaign against the JCPOA. And um, so that it was that the, that the NC, the NSA, wiretaps essentially that were used against that were exposed later as having been used against trump uh and his team uh in i think it was it might have been during the election so i can't remember anymore what what lee smith documented in his books and then and then during the uh the period from november 2016 to january 2017 that 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 the precursor to that was actually the uh, spying on american jews who were opposed to the uh, iran deal so that it's sort of like it it all went hand in hand and i'm sort of stunned by the overall nature of it because you know if if you wanted to characterize sort of what what the vision of people who are stifling you know what are called nationalists but i guess you could call them then nationalist voices in the west and nationalist political movements in the in the west and and in israel what do they want? I mean, why are they so anti-democratic? The, the people who are in a lot of these parties are extremely pro-Israel. I mean, all Israelis are, I mean, pro-American. Israelis in general are pro-American. Why would they, what, what is it that they, what is it that they want? What is their vision? Well, you know, the, the easiest way as I see is just to follow the money. Yeah, you have, you have this situation. I mean, so, I mean, take, take what's happening right now with, with the, the Biden world, you know, diplomacy with, with Iran right now. You have this, this situation where I think you, the, the Biden State Department saw it as politically infeasible to try to reinflate the JCPOA. And so, you know, there's, there's this strange alliance with China. You had the fact that the Hunter Biden laptop emails were completely devastating on this issue. You, know, you had direct text messages from Hunter Biden where he talked about how his client was the spy chief of China, you know, where he, where, you know, the spy chief the, the, of China, he's telling his sister, you know, that he's concerned ab- about, you know, about blowback from that. And, you know, he's, he's actively talking about, uh, you know, the China's, uh, it says, one of the emails is Hunter Biden pitching Ch- uh, a, a, a portfolio of Chinese investors to buy up uh, a liquefied natural gas port, an LNG port in Louisiana. Uh, you know, so you've got these personal partnerships with Chinese energy mega firms like like CEFC China Energy, and you have the, you know, you have 
literal, you know, the Hunt White House first family partnerships with the spy chief of China. But how are they? What's happening with the Iran diplomacy right now to get around uh, to get around the reinstatement of sanctions? Well, in 2021, you know, the first year of Biden's presidency, China and Iran signed a 400 billion dollar joint security energy deal where where Iran is exporting $400 billion worth of oil and gas to China. Meanwhile, we know that China was partnered with the first family, at least in their in, in Hunter Biden's private capacity, but that probably touches the whole West exec network and, and Atlantic Council network. I mean, it, it looks to me like they are using a sort of uh, alliance with China as a backdoor Iran Wait, nuclear what's, deal. What's it? What, West, West exec? Yeah, well, that was the that was the incubator firm. Yeah, you know, this that was the sort of uh, shadow, sh- you know, shadow government, if you will. After after the Obama administration, there was a firm called West Exec, which was set yeah, up. Yeah, I it, know. It, right, and that was, was Avril with- Haines and uh, and Tony Blinken and the, that whole that whole network of you know blob creatures that is foreign policy establishment folks from this, everyone from the CIA to the Pentagon to the State Department who were basically kept in cold storage. After you know, after the Obama administration for the first term of the Trump administration, and then recycled through the revolving door immediately into senior positions in the Biden foreign policy establishment. You know, it's it's that whole world, you know, that um, you know that's that's deeply connected to, to Hunter and the whole you know Biden first family, and you know, so so I see you know in terms of what they want. In my view, you can answer it as simply as money. I mean, the fact is, is Israel's security interests stood in the way of this foreign policy faction's financial interests. And there's, you know, there's a trillion dollars of natural gas, you know, um, you know, uh, contracts on the line. If you can open up, you know, I- Iran and I mean, that's they, they sit on the world's number three and number four supplies, respectively, of oil and gas already. Their exports have 10 X just over the past Four years, I think it went from something like eight billion dollars in sort of black market exports to, you know, almost a hundred billion dollars just in just in four years without even having an Iran nuclear deal, and that's not even counting the the China money. So, um, and again, you know, those, those that China money is partner money. I don't even see China as being an entity unto itself in that respect. You know, it operates through partnerships with with London and Wall Street stakeholders. And so, you know, what you, what I see here with you know with with this move to regime change Israel is, is just plain business for, uh, for a bunch of bad actors within the U S foreign policy establishment. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the reason why I stopped you in West X, X, West X is that that was a firm that uh, former prime minister, Ehud Barak contacted when he was putting out his, uh, spy wear tool, um, Paragon, uh, as a, competitor or replacement for Pegasus, the uh, spyware uh, that had been put out by other Israelis, and it was an Israeli company that was acting sort of to advance the uh, diplomatic and strategic interests of Israel in the international markets. And it was blacklisted by the U.S. after the Biden administration. And Ehud Barak came to April Gang, uh, Haynes, and, and, uh, and, um, and Tony Blinken, et cetera, and Dan Shapiro, the former ambassador to Israel, was uh, was in part of this deal. And according to the Financial Times, he said to them, look, you know, um, we will actually, instead of advancing the interests of Israel, uh, we'll advance your interests. And so you should just use us. And they got, in a, they got a deal with the DEA at the same time that Kandira and uh, NSO Group were getting blacklisted by by the United States and blocked from international markets. So that's kind of, you know, interesting. And he's in, 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 in turn, he's been the leader really of the effort by Israel's elites to oust Netanyahu from power and, and has been one of the main funnels for financing for all the anti-government demonstrations here since the administration's, uh, Netanyahu government came into power, but uh, so it's it sort of all wrapped in a nice bow, I guess. Well, that's so fascinating because 
Avril Haines was the deputy CIA director under Obama. She was the number two at the CIA. And then she was again put in cold storage shoot through the sort of Westic, you know, exec uh, thing. Then you're saying that's when Yehud Barak contacted her. What is she doing now? She's the head of the OD, of the ODNI. She is the director of national intelligence. She is the right, CIA. Right, and they just put out this new report that said that uh, there are going to be mass demonstrations in Israel to oust Netanyahu from power. Well, right, but I that means earlier this week. Really. But if Barak working with Avril Haines, Avril Haines is the boss of all bosses in the intelligence community now. She was promoted to that. Uh, well, so girlfriend. that's. They, <laughs> for better or worse, I in should this be case. for him, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, that's uh, that's how they get, yeah. But um, that that is that is really fascinating. You know, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, all contact was cut off at that point. But um, real, that's a really fascinating anecdote. I didn't even know that. So I think that we should probably uh, round up this conversation. And I just hear, I wouldn't mind if you would just give a little bit because one of the things we jumped into the meat of it before we got to the bones, which is the structure of how this uh, censorship network sort of works. So what, how, how to, like you said that they opened up this uh, global engagement center in 2007, but how, what is, can you just like end, end this conversation with me just sort of at the beginning? Like, what are we talking about? What, what is a censorship next, you know, enterprise look like? How, do, how does that even work? So the formal term that they use for it is whole of government, whole of society, which is this idea that that censorship, that, that free speech on the internet is too big a challenge for any one aspect of society to take on on its own. You know, they'll use a term like mis, dis, and malinformation. And of course, malinformation means true information, but that contributes to a misleading narrative. So it's not just false or deceptive content. It's just, it's true information that if people believe it, will undermine public faith and confidence in something of concern to the foreign policy establishment. So this is, you know, their, their formal term for it is, you know, the, is the whole of government, whole of society, counter mis dis and mal But it was, this was quarterbacked from, uh, you know, basically from 2017 through 2022 um, in, in, in the Department of Homeland Security. It's now diffusing, and I can go through how it's restructured, but essentially what the whole of society you can, you, the, what the whole society model is, is it's four categories of institutions who are fused together as a single one. And that's government institutions, private sector institutions, civil society institutions, and media institutions. Okay, so, so on the government side, they, 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 they say whole, whole society, whole of government. And that means every U.S. government agency that can contribute resources to countering this dis and malinformation, which means censoring it. They don't mean counter speech. They mean flagging it to take it down. So that's everything from DHS to the FBI, to the State Department, to the Pentagon, to the National Science Foundation, to then the proprietary government agencies on any individual issue. You know, so so you know it'll be you know HHS for for COVID censorship, or um, you know you, you name it. Um, uh, in the in the private sector quadrant, so that's good, the government quadrant. In the private sector quadrant, it's the tech platforms themselves. You know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, Discord. TikTok, you know, all the different private sector companies. It's also the uh, private censorship mercenary firms. These are groups like Graphica. These are, you know, pop up. These are groups who have a, who, who sell censorship products and services. And it's also the corporate social responsibility endowments of major blue chip companies who need favors from the U.S. government. So they partner on a favors, favors basis. There's the third quadrant is civil society. And those are the universities, the NGOs, the foundations, the nonprofits, and the community leaders and activist groups who are all onboarded. So they will participate in these stakeholder meetings. You know, this is, there's six, there's over 60 U.S. universities currently getting U.S. government funding, over a hundred million dollars in government funding just to these 60 universities in order to do full-time censorship work. These are government grants and contracts, you know, so they can function as part of this whole society network. And then the fourth category is media which they refer to as news news plus fact checking. And and so these are like-minded politically aligned media outlets like the New York Times, the uh, the Washington Post, you know, Politico, Daily Beast, you know, the, there's there's hundreds of these there's as well as the fact checking groups 
which all get, you know, these fact checking groups, none of them are independent. Pointer, the Pointer Institute, for example, is one of the biggest ones. It gets joint funding from the George Soros Open Society Foundation. And it's got, I think, 17 or 18 different State Department grants in, in order to use it, that fact checking apparatus to manipulate elections around the world by getting populist groups censored. So these four categories, government, private sector, civil society, and news media, you know, this is not my term for it. I literally took this directly from them because in 2017, at these stakeholder meetings that I was listening in on, they would talk about the need to create essentially a, a, a domestic analog for, the, uh, for, for counterinsurgency tactics because they viewed the rise of populism the same way as, as you know, uh, Islamofascism or communism. And that in order to be, you know, what is our military doctrine for, for taking out you know, political insurgency groups all around the world? Well, we need this axis of the government players in the region, the, the commercial players in the region, the media players in the region, and all the foundations and NGOs who are pumping soft power into it. And so that's the way it's structured here in the U.S. and, and in the U.K. And in, and in Europe and all the different NATO countries where this has been established. And, and at their own stakeholder meetings, it reflects this. You, know, you will have joint panels where there will be someone from the Department of Homeland Security and someone from the State Department. Sitting right next to them will be, will be someone from the Trust and Safety Team at Facebook, usually having previously worked for the CIA or the State Department or the Pentagon. And then sitting right next to them will be someone from an NGO someone from the Atlanta Council or the German Marshall Fund or the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. And sitting right next to them will be, a, will be a Washington Post reporter who specializes in national security or intelligence. And they're all jointly coordinating. And then there'll be follow-up white papers. And then there'll be policy proposals. And then there'll be government grant applications. And then it will filter its way into, you know, talking points from Chuck Schumer or from, you know, or from State Department officials. This is the consensus building architecture and it ties together every aspect of our society in order to have a full spectrum surround sound on what you can say and what goes viral on the internet. That's an amazing thing. I think I think we should probably stop it there because otherwise we're going to go on for four hours, which would be fine with me. But I'm not sure how large our our viewership would be if they if they saw that this was a four hour video. But listen, Mike, um, I guess uh, in the event that there's a, a second Trump administration, you 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 know, hopefully you would get a position to to stop this. But you know, I I hope that just uh, um, forewarned is forearmed, and uh, you know, when we look at the kinds of things that are being done uh, in a censorship uh, dominant world today, um, that we we have to we have to really value our vote, you know. We have to really, we have to really protect that and make sure that our governments are chosen by voters and and uh, and and look forward to a future where where our say won't be squelched and smothered by by the internet platforms that our lives are really dependent on in so many different ways today. So um, I, I appreciate very much you shining the light on this and also that you know. You working, you know, helping me to to figure out what what is going on here in terms of the uh, the thumb on the scales uh, that's been you know pushed into a fist over over the past couple of weeks in Israel. I hope that you you know all of us working together are going to be able to fix this somehow or another. I don't know. Well, thank you, Caroline, for your time. You know, I, I think that we've got a lot of momentum right now in terms of exposure. And, uh, you know, even the New York Times just yesterday lamented the impact of folks like Stephen Miller and and uh, and everyone and being able to uh, being able to, to score a number of victories in the past 12 months that were thought to be impossible 24 months ago. So, you know, our job is to keep that momentum going and keep the wind in our sails. And I appreciate everything you're doing and your important voice on all of this. I will take care and God bless you. And, and we may have you back again uh, as as the as the chips fall where they may. I'm sure that you'll be playing a role holding them or, or dropping them one by one, as the case may be. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Carol.